Imagine a miniature sun, nearly four kilometers in diameter, blazing in the heart of a city for 10 seconds. That is what a nuclear explosion's fireball would feel like. This is actual footage from a nuclear test, where you can see how the paint on a school bus, positioned several kilometers from the fireball, ignites instantly from the intense heat. Imagine the damage such intense heat could inflict on human skin. Despite their immense destructive power, nuclear weapons are often referred to as weapons of peace. While this might sound ironic, there is some truth to it. The sheer fear of nuclear weapons has played a role in preventing a world war since the end of World War II. Initially, only five nations possessed nuclear weapons. At the peak of the Cold War, the two major powers, the United States and the Soviet Union, held a combined stockpile of over 50,000 nuclear warheads. Both sides understood that if one country used nuclear weapons, it would lead to total destruction of both. Even if all leadership in a country were eliminated in a devastating first strike, automated systems like the dead hand system would ensure the enemy country's destruction. This idea of mutually assured destruction, MAD, acted as a powerful deterrent, preventing the use of nuclear weapons and, to some extent, the Third World War. Today, however, the situation has changed. At least nine countries are now confirmed to have nuclear weapons, with one more suspected to possess them. This means multiple leaders across the globe have their hands on the trigger. If ever backed into a corner, the risk of one of them pulling the trigger is very high. In a scenario like this, it is crucial to understand what exactly happens in a nuclear explosion. How immense is its destructive power? How is the energy released? What makes it different from conventional explosions? And what is the dead hand system? Let us explore these questions in this video. Hi friends, welcome to a new episode from Science Simplified for All. The energy source of a conventional bomb is usually some kind of chemical reaction. But with a nuclear bomb, the energy source is a nuclear reaction. There are two main types of nuclear reactions. One is nuclear fission, which releases energy by breaking apart the nucleus of heavier elements like uranium and plutonium. The other is nuclear fusion, which releases energy by combining hydrogen nuclei to form a helium nucleus. Bombs that operate using nuclear fission are commonly called atom bombs, while those using nuclear fusion are known as hydrogen bombs. I am not going to go into detail about how an atom bomb works right now, but let us cover the basics. Nuclear fission is a chain reaction. When a neutron hits the nucleus of a uranium or plutonium atom, the nucleus splits, releasing two or three more neutrons. These neutrons then go on to split other uranium nuclei, each time releasing additional neutrons. This reaction grows exponentially, happening within fractions of a second. With each cycle, the reaction rate increases dramatically, ultimately resulting in a massive explosion. Now, let us take a look at the energy released in one of these reactions and how powerful it is. When a conventional bomb explodes, it releases chemical energy stored in the explosive material. For example, trinitrotoluene, TNT, is a common explosive in conventional bombs. It releases about 10 electron volts of energy per molecule. In a nuclear reaction, however, the energy released comes from the nuclear energy stored within the nucleus of an atom. This energy is far greater. When a single uranium-235 nucleus undergoes fission, it releases approximately 200 million electron volts. The energy from a single uranium atom is about 20 million times the energy from a single TNT molecule. That is the fundamental difference between chemical reactions and nuclear reactions. This 200 million electron volts energy produced during fission breaks down as follows. 5 million electron volts is carried by the released neutrons, which go on to trigger more fission reactions. 7 million electron volts is emitted as gamma radiation, which is a form of light. 20 million electron volts is released as beta radiation. The remaining 168 million electron volts appears as kinetic energy in the fission fragments. It is this kinetic energy that becomes intense heat. As we mentioned, 
the chain reaction rate increases exponentially in a very short time. By the time it reaches its final stages, billions of fission reactions are taking place simultaneously, producing extreme heat. The temperature inside the bomb, just before the explosion, reaches about 10 million degrees Celsius, similar to the core of the sun. This extreme heat and pressure ultimately cause the explosion. This is an extreme slow-motion video of a nuclear explosion test. You can clearly see the fireball expanding. The footage was taken using a special type of high-speed camera called a Raptronic camera, which has a shutter speed of just 10 nanoseconds. These cameras were originally developed specifically to capture the details of nuclear explosions. Although this is called a fireball, this is not actually fire. This is plasma. Due to the immense heat from fission reaction, the bomb's contents, mainly the unused uranium, fission products, bomb components, and even the surrounding air, are all converted into plasma. What we see here is a ball of material in a plasma state, expanding rapidly from extreme heat and pressure. In parts of the fireball, you might notice what looks like flames extending outward. This effect is caused by the steel ropes used to suspend the bomb during the test. Before the fireball reaches these ropes, gamma rays produced by the fission reaction traveling at the speed of light hit the ropes first. While gamma radiation itself is not visible on camera, its intense energy heats the steel ropes instantly turning them into plasma. As mentioned earlier, the temperature of the fireball reaches about 10 million degrees Celsius. At this extreme temperature, very high pressure builds up inside, causing the fireball to expand. As it grows, the temperature starts to drop. The maximum size of an atom bomb's fireball depends on the bomb's strength. For an average atom bomb, the fireball can reach up to a kilometer in radius. Everything within this area is not simply burned or melted. It is vaporized in an instant. By the time it reaches maximum size, the surface temperature of the fireball will have dropped to about 5,000 degrees Celsius, similar to the temperature of the sun's surface. This fireball remains visible for roughly 10 seconds after the explosion, then begins to fade. Imagine a miniature sun blazing for 10 seconds in the heart of a city. That is what it would be like if an atom bomb were to detonate. During nuclear tests, some observers even reported that when they instinctively covered their eyes with their hands, they could see the bones of their hands illuminated through their flesh. The blinding flash of the explosion was so intense that it created an effect similar to an X-ray, momentarily revealing the bones beneath their skin. Now, let us assess the damage caused by the detonation of a nuclear bomb in the middle of a city. The explosive power of nuclear bombs is typically measured in terms of TNT tonnage. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima had a yield of 15 kilotons, or the equivalent of 15,000 tons of TNT. However, the capacity of today's atom bombs is much higher. One of the reasonably sized nuclear bombs in the arsenals of today's superpowers is a one megaton bomb. Let us consider what would happen if such a bomb exploded in the middle of a city. The damage caused by a nuclear explosion can be divided into several stages. The first stage is damage caused by the fireball. The fireball from a 1 megaton bomb would have a radius of approximately 1.6 kilometers. That is about 3.2 kilometers in diameter. As we discussed earlier, everything within this area would be vaporized instantly. This is the first stage of damage. As was mentioned earlier, the fireball's surface temperature reaches levels similar to that of the sun's surface. Imagine the situation very close to sun. Nearly the same effects would happen to objects near this fireball. Tremendous heat radiates outward in the form of thermal radiation, making all directly exposed objects extremely hot. All flammable objects within 11 kilometers of the fireball's radius will ignite. This means that everything that can burn, trees, wooden buildings, paper, clothing, even the paint on vehicles, will catch fire. People's skin and hair will burn severely, causing third-degree burns. People directly exposed to the fireball within 11 to 14 kilometers would suffer second-degree burns. Anyone 
looking directly at the fireball from within approximately 20 kilometers risks permanent blindness. This is the second stage of damage. One haunting effect observed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki was the creation of permanent shadows. The intense light from the explosion instantly bleached surfaces, but wherever people blocked the light, ghostly silhouettes were left behind. These shadows mark where people once stood, serving as a stark reminder of the explosion's devastating brightness and the lives lost within its radius. So far, we have discussed damage caused by heat from an atom bomb explosion. This only occurs in a nuclear explosion. Since such high temperatures are not reached in conventional bomb explosions, these types of thermal damages do not occur there. For a conventional explosion, the main damage comes from the pressure wave or shock wave that follows the blast. When a nuclear bomb explodes, the heat is so intense that it creates a more powerful shock wave. The third stage of damage results from that shock wave. If a one megaton nuclear bomb detonates, the shock wave will completely destroy all buildings, including concrete structures within a five kilometer radius. The entire area within this radius will be flattened. Between 5 and 8 kilometers, wooden buildings would collapse entirely and concrete structures would be severely damaged. Wooden buildings from 8 to 12 kilometers from the blast would also suffer extensive damage. Most major powers have conducted numerous nuclear tests. An approximate count of these tests is shown in this chart. Estimates of nuclear explosion damages are based on data gathered from these tests. Some footage from these tests has also been released. In this video, we can see that when a nuclear explosion occurs, buildings first begin to emit smoke from thermal radiation. Similarly, the paint on cars can be seen igniting almost instantly. The shockwave arrives a bit later and its impact can be seen clearly in the footage. A unique feature of such explosions is that after the initial shockwave passes, a second, milder pressure wave flows in the reverse direction. This is known as the reverse blast. When the first shock wave passes, a large amount of air is displaced from the explosion site, creating a low pressure zone. The reverse blast occurs as surrounding air rushes in to fill this low pressure area. Partially collapsed buildings are often completely flattened by this reverse wave. These are the immediate damages caused when an atom bomb explodes. In addition, as mentioned, flammable objects within an 11-kilometer radius can ignite due to thermal radiation. This can easily lead to a massive firestorm causing extensive further damage. Radiation exposure from the radioactive material released will also result in long-lasting damage, affecting many generations. What we have discussed so far shows the damage that can be caused by a one megaton nuclear bomb. A one megaton bomb would be a hydrogen bomb. Traditional nuclear fission bombs, commonly called atom bombs, typically have yields up to about 500 kilotons. However, nuclear fusion bombs, also known as thermonuclear bombs or hydrogen bombs, can have much higher yields. The United States even tested a thermonuclear bomb with a yield of 15 megatons. This test, called Castle Bravo, took place in 1954 in the Pacific Ocean at Bikini Atoll. The Castle Bravo explosion created a fireball approximately 3 kilometers in radius, with the temperature inside reaching around 100 million degrees Celsius. With such extreme figures, we can imagine the destructive power at each stage of the explosion. The designers of the bomb had initially predicted an explosive yield of 5 megatons, but unanticipated nuclear reactions increased the yield to 15 megatons, tripling the expected power. However, Castle Bravo was not the largest nuclear bomb ever tested. That distinction goes to the Tsar Bomba, developed by the USSR. This bomb had a yield of 50 megatons. The fireball of the bomb was a whopping 10 kilometers in diameter, reaching the altitude from which it was dropped. Originally designed with the potential for a 100 megaton yield, its capacity was reduced to 50 megatons for the test, which was conducted in 1961. This was the Cold War era, marked by an intense nuclear arms race 
between the United States and the USSR. At that time, it was estimated that each country possessed over 30,000 nuclear weapons, most with a capacity of more than 5 megatons. During this period, the USSR developed an automated system known as the Dead Hand. This system was designed as a last resort measure to ensure retaliation even if Russia's leadership and military command were incapacitated by a first nuclear strike. Human intervention was required only for the initial activation of the system. Once activated, the dead hand relied on specialized sensors to detect key indicators of a nuclear attack. Intense light, ground vibrations, shockwave pressure and radioactivity. If these sensors confirmed an attack and no communication was received from the nuclear command center within a specified time frame, the system would automatically launch Russia's missiles toward predetermined targets. Given Russia's arsenal at the time, it is estimated that 10,000 nuclear weapons could have been launched in such a scenario. This concept is a stark example of mutually assured destruction at its most extreme. Such systems were designed to deter any nuclear first strike by ensuring catastrophic consequences for both sides. It is an unsettling reminder that the threat of nuclear Armageddon was very real, resembling the Judgment Day portrayed in movies like The Terminator. Some experts believe that systems similar to Dead Hand might still exist today, although details remain uncertain. But it is worth noting that the number and capacity of nuclear weapons held by the United States and Russia have significantly decreased compared to the Cold War era. Nuclear bombs with capacities up to 1.2 megatons are likely the largest in their current arsenals. Additionally, instead of 30,000, each country now holds around 6,000 nuclear weapons. However, the number of countries possessing nuclear weapons has increased. Today, eight countries are confirmed to have nuclear weapons. There are unconfirmed reports that Israel possesses them as well, and Iran is also suspected of pursuing them. No country publicly shares the exact capacity or number of nuclear weapons in its possession. However, based on available online information, we can make approximate estimates. While these figures may not be completely accurate, they help give a general sense of the global nuclear landscape. With this information, it is difficult to see nuclear weapons as weapons of peace. In this video, we saw the potential devastation a one megaton bomb could unleash if detonated in a city. No city on Earth deserves such destruction, and it is a sentiment shared by many worldwide. Unfortunately, such decisions rest in the hands of a select few leaders and officials. Please share your thoughts on this topic in the comments. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it. For more content like this, subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon for notifications. Thank you.